This is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. With visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budget, and more, NetSuite is everything you need to grow, all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increased their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite. And right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at NetSuite.com slash C-Suite. Head to NetSuite.com slash C-Suite for special end-of-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. NetSuite.com slash C-Suite. Hey, everybody, it's Mark Pattison back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. Before I get to today's amazing guest, I want to draw everybody's attention to the website, www, I think there's one too many W's, <laughs> dot mm-hmm. markpattisonnfl.com. And again, there's loads of podcasts. I've done 225 of these uh, about incredible people doing amazing things. I would appreciate a ratings and review to help elevate the popularity of the show. Number one. Number two is I am headed now down to Ecuador to climb a mountain called Cotopaxi for a birthday for me coming up. And I continue to look for different challenges and you'll see different updates about that journey and expedition coming up soon on the website. Finally, I have the movie that's now out on YouTube, searching for the summit. The NFL created this incredible piece of art that I'm really proud of. It involves uh, my daughter who has epilepsy and the healing powers that have gone on with that. And then just as a, as a recap and staying on that same same line, there's a philanthropy tab. I continue to raise money for, for higher ground for Amelia's Everest, and we're all out trying to help others get healed. Okay, so that's that on the website. Let's get into today's guest. I've known this dude for a long time. He had a great career. We actually we had a very similar career in the NFL. And now I'm I'm very happy to have him on the podcast. Ed Cunningham, how are you doing? Hi, Mark. I, it's, I, I, I wish I was Googling you the whole time. I'd go donate and all that. It's amazing all the stuff you got going on. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's interesting how life happens. And uh, we're going to get into your life. And and you've been, uh, the one thing I really have appreciated about you and your journey is you've always kept it really interesting. I remember many years ago, uh, the Washington Huskies, uh, who you also played for, you were more, I think about maybe five years that you came after me and part yeah. of that great uh, 91 championship team with all those amazing players. But You know, I I can remember being down in some bar and the Huskies were playing Arizona State and, 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 you know, you're all gunned up and you're playing for the Cardinals. And we had a great chat and you just you you just had so many other interests Mm. beyond just the NFL. And I, I just have always really appreciated those who have just taken their star power and trying to do other things and have that brain you know, in in high gear of thinking, what's life after football and how's it going to go? And for you, you know, you had a very successful um, run and we'll get into that in just a few minutes, but let's go back to, to um, your, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but I want to, you know, they always talk about that 91 team with Edmund Mm -hmm. and everybody else as being one of the greatest Husky teams of all time. I would disagree. I think our 85 team that uh, beat Oklahoma is the greatest team of all time. Well, the 90, the 90 team would have beat us all. We just didn't know how good we were. The 90 team I think was actually better than the 91 team. If, if uh, they played, we had, we had four or five seniors, including Dennis Brown, yeah, guy named Travis Richardson, uh, Greg Lewis, when he was healthy. Great. Uh, yeah. So we had some guys on that 90 team. We just, uh, we stubbed our toe late in the season against UCLA, but, uh, but I'd argue <laughs> for the 90 team, maybe. Well, however you slice it, the reality yeah. is, you know, what's in the score scorebook. Uh, yeah, score yeah. Oh, yeah. And the reality is, is you guys won the national championship and won the Rose bowl. Um, it was amazing to follow. And there were so many great, great athletes. And, and as a result of that, 
you know, you went on. And I, I've, I've talked many, many times about what Don James, our former mm. head coach, Hall of Famer, now passed um, away. Uh, but what did he do for you? What was the roadmap of life he gave you? I think, Mark, and, and you know, it's guys who played for Don James, I think we all share a unique thing that uh, we were challenged because I know you are the same way. I mean, obviously you've built a terrific career post your, your playing career um, is we were challenged on and off the field. I never felt like it was a football factory, but it was a football factory. We still work as hard. We still had a leading edge weight room and, and, you know, uh, explosive trade. You know, we did all of the things. We changed our entire offense. We were one of the first offenses that ran the one back offense. Washington state was first. We were second, I think in all of major college football. So there was all cutting edge football factory, but all the doors were not only open for us on campus, but also around the community. But coach James built a structure where he had business people coming in and talk to us. We got business cards from these guys. I sat down with one of the Nordstrom brothers before I left just to talk about business. And, you know, some of the guys who built downtown Seattle, who used to play for the Huskies, opened their door. And that really helped me see sort of, well, there can be an entrepreneur side to this stuff too, because I've got to meet older guys uh, that had graduated and become in the construction business or, you know, whatever their business was. And I think that was the thing when people talk about the program and I, I, on my, I do a podcast, but I'm also thinking about a book of coach James program and how you apply it to your life and to businesses because Nick Saban, whenever he brings up influences, it starts with Don James. And that was the part for me that I could have gone to other colleges where I think it would have just been about football and maybe you'd meet some boosters because they just wanted to hang out with you. But there was always a purpose when we met people. There was always, this guy is here to talk to you about the finance business. And he's brought some colleagues with him. You know, we had these presentations and that was just, um, and, and Seattle at the time, probably one of the best sports eras. That's when, you know, the tech industry started booming late eighties, early nineties. Grunge is going on, best music in the world old best, best music scene in the world. So I was able to experience that because we were, we were allowed to have lives away. From, just be there on time and, and try hard. You know, we got time off. We got to go do other things. So I was really grateful because I didn't know any of that when I went there. I went there because I was chasing a girl and there was Don James. <laughs> it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Um, but that's, um, you know, I think those of us who got to know him and play for him or be around him and work for him, that was the unique part is we got, we did both. We did life and we did football full time. I mean, we worked hard, you know, we were in the modern era where you were in there all the time working. Yeah. I, I think what the, the thing I'm, I'm liking about the way you're describing the story is that the evolution of our head coach, Don James, because mm -hmm. all the little goodies that you just spit out, we didn't have, um, we didn't have business people come oh, and talk to us. And, and as a wide receiver, you know, you guys had the benefit of Keith Gilberson coming in and really starting that whole West Coast offense where you're putting four receivers on the field. And we were loaded with talent at, at receiver, you know, back in my day, everybody, yeah. quarterbacks and receivers all went off to tell the NFL, everybody. And yeah. so it would have been great to have been part of an offense like that. But what you're describing is Don James, like, because I remember kind of in the gap between myself graduating at the time is the highest ranked we'd ever been. We beat Oklahoma in the orange bowl and getting to really 1990, there was some lean years in there where, you know, it's just like, Oh yeah. He had to reinvent. Yeah, I was there when he was on the hot seat. He was yeah. on the hot seat. Right. And so that was yeah. not a slam dunk. And so it, it's, it's wonderful for a guy that's aging. That's always done things the exact same way. And it's always kind of worked for him the exact same way. All of a sudden things aren't working so well. He flipped it on its head. I was there when it happened. We lost to Washington State, really good Washington State team coach by Dennis Erickson with the one back offense. And we were up 28 3 at half. This is 1988, I think. And they beat us 31 28. <laughs> so we had score point and they rattled off 28 in the second half to beat us. And we it dropped us six and five. They went to the uh, uh, Aloha Bowl. We stayed home for the first time since probably before you got there. I mean, it was yeah. like a 10 or 12 year run. They'd gone to bowls 
And a lot of us were going to leave. I was gone. My bags were packed. I didn't like my coach. And I will say the offense was as stale as it gets. You know, we, we were not doing anything interesting. One thing that kept a lot of us around is before he changed recruiting in, uh, and this was through Dick Baird and what Dick Baird brought to the program. Yeah. I think he started to trust Dick more and he started Dick to get, trust Dick that he could get really good athletes. Cause we had some ballers in my class, class above me, that my class and, and Steve Entman and Lincoln Kennedy and Mark Brunel's class, we could play. We, and we had a lot of guys who could play. So the talent we could see was there, but it was just headed in the wrong direction. The team morale was awful. People were infighting. Some of the older guys wouldn't even practice hard by the end of the season, just sort of mailing it in. I'm, like, I'm waiting for the NFL, and all the young guys are like, yeah, that's not how it works, man. <laughs> you got to play hard to go play in the NFL. And then two, two really major things happened, which was we, we went a little away from let's just be the biggest brutes uh, up front and have the biggest, strongest guys, where we all actually started losing some weight and getting quicker and faster, and, and there was a, a – a, a absolute focus on speed, not only in recruiting, but also we all got faster. So we, we redid our entire training program from lots of hours in the weight room to more hours with plyometrics, running techniques. Uh, you may know Jeff Woodruff, who coached receivers, and Jeff really took on that program. We brought in an Olympic uh, sprinting coach. And then, you know, recruiting people like Napoleon Kaufman, Bino Bryant, guys who had world-class speed yeah. helped. We also got faster. And then there was two big changes where Keith Gilbertson comes in and saves a lot of guys that would have left. I would have left Bern Brostek, who was a, a yeah. you know, number eight pick or whatever, would have left. Yeah. We were just all miserable. Gilby comes in. He's a great guy. He keeps people there. And the offense is amazing. At the same time, Jim Lambright really doesn't get the credit that he deserves because – Gilby did something that was so unique with a one back offense and you'd throw it and, and, and Don James had to get very comfortable with the short passing game being safe. And we just, he just like, you just got to keep trusting me. It is safe. It's like, it's not getting returned the other way. We don't do that. You don't throw to, you know, Gilby really had his plan, but Jim went to an attacking style. He had enough defensive backs where they could play a lot of man to man. And then he started doing these really cool coverages that were hard to read stuff that just wasn't in college football. Um, and I'll tell a story. I covered Virginia tech and Bud Foster was a defense quarter there coordinator there. This is 25 years after he, he went on a visit to Washington. He was still using stuff. Jim Limebright used 25 years later at Virginia tech. And then we just had guys who could buy and We had, you know, we, we had a good, and then the culture changed because we were all good guys. We like to compete, but you're right. I, I was there when it happened. He completely changed Everything. Having Keith Gilbertson come in, realizing they had to make it a probably a more holistic program, I think really did not uh, forget save jobs. We wouldn't have risen those heights any night. So you're right. I was there when it all happened. It was at 88, 89, 90. Well, it sort of started in 87, but that 88, 89, 90 transition was, uh, he flipped it all in its head. But well, I'll say this, and you know him well enough. Yeah. It was like it was all meant to be, and here's the new plan. Yeah. There was <laughs> there was never any, oh, what do we do? The house on fire. I mean, when he showed up and you know, we were just it was st he still ran it as a really well oiled machine, but you're right, in many ways it's all brand new for him in those years. Yeah, and you know this. I mean, if you're not growing, you're dying. Okay, you, in other words, you're either going forward or you're going backwards. So the whole neutral thing, especially in college, big time college sports in the NFL doesn't work really any kind of sport. You you end up getting drafted by the Arizona Cardinals. And and again, we'll just touch on that for just a minute. But what was your NFL career experience like? It was it was bad in, in a couple of ways, in that I was drafted by an organization that's now great, the Cardinals, but at the time you know, it was a family owned operation and, and, you know, it just wasn't the slickest business unit. <laughs> and that sort of showed up. We had, we had, I got, I came into a really dysfunctional coaching situation where a few people in charge weren't the best for the job. And so that's hard because a game like football, if you don't have the top two or three people really nailed down in the coaching tree, it's just not going to work. We had really good players. It was really hard. I mean, I don't know if you went through this, but it was just shocking how many guys looked and played like Steve Entman in the NFL. 
yeah. you know, see, you mentioned Steve Edmond, who was the number one pick and when the out on the party, he was the only guy in college who could just sort of run me over whatever he wanted to. Yeah. When I got to the NFL, almost every guy he played could run you over anytime they wanted to. So it's just that level of physical effort and playing with a lot of scrimmage. You played, you know, receiver, you're getting blown up by really big people. A lot of scrimmage. I was grappling with some just huge, powerful men. And, and it was also brutality in camp. We had five days of two a days the first year I was in the NFL full go two a day. So two, two and a half hours, twice a day, and then played for preseason games. And then as a rookie who had been drafted high enough and was starting, I had to do all the reps in every preseason game. So I'm playing 50, 60 snaps, a <laughs> preseason game. And it was just brutal. The, the, the cherry on top was though, I ended up back four years in Arizona, ended up back in Seattle with the Seahawks for just one year. And I was one foot out the door. Dennis Erickson was the coach, which brought it full circle. Keith Gilbertson was on that staff. Yeah. I had some interest. I got, I got cut by uh, the Bears going into camp and had some interest from a few teams. But Gilby, Keith Gilbertson called me and, and he's like, look, we got a good team. And they did. We were really good. We were, we were in a very competitive division. And Dennis didn't beat us up. We had good players. We, we practiced one time a day in full pads during camp and did walkthroughs in the afternoon. My body never felt better. And we got two quarterbacks hurt. Otherwise, we'd probably play off team. And it was fun. Guys were good guys. I played with Chris Warren, who was, you know, legendary player, but also just a great guy. We're both from Virginia, so had a nice connection. So yeah. I'm so thankful that it ended. And I'll never forget leaving. Dennis Erickson called me in at, after our last meeting. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I think I'm out the door. And he, you know, he tried to talk me into staying, which I was flattered by. Because, you know, I like, he liked having me around. And we, we were similar guys, a sense of humor. And he looked at me, he's like, yeah, I thought you were gone. <laughs> he just knew it. <laughs> I'd, had, I'd had enough. Well, look, for many of us who have played the game, you know, when you add up all the hours and the days and everything else, and you go back to really, you know, going starting at the University of Washington, I'm not, I'm not counting high school, but at the UW, I was there five years because I redshirted a year, but whether you count that as four or five, and then you go into the NFL and there's another five, it's really 10 years competing at the highest level. Yeah. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to tell you that I went to the UW and I, you know, I st studied microbiology or something, but I, I was really majored in football. I mean, that's really what, uh, yeah. what it got down to. And so, you know, going off that cliff was really hard for me. And, and I want to ask you about that because as you did ultimately transition into something that so many players want to go after, but it's such a competitive space, but somehow or another, you were able to rise above all the other guys that are girls that are out there trying to become a broadcaster in college football and you actually did it. So was that gap between making the decision that I need to walk away from football to what am I going to do next? Was that hard or was that fairly seamless for you? Well, it's, it goes back to what we were talking about. I started doing radio in 91 on KISW in Seattle during our senior season. Yeah. Actually, for my podcast, I have an episode with the guy Spike O'Neill, Spike on Sports. This is a he rock station. This is the rock station. Right? Yeah, yeah. He, went to, he, he, he showed up uh, the fall of 91. He's like, I want to do a show, a weekly show. And our sports information director at the time is like, Ed, Ed gives great sound bites. Use Ed. And so I got into radio. He didn't pay me, obviously, but I was on yeah. every week and then would go into the studio. And then when, when I got to the NFL, I was talking to – that was right when sports radio was starting to happen. So it wasn't 24-7, but KTAR in Phoenix, which I think still carries the Cardinals, they had a 7 to 10 show Monday through Friday. And – the general manager or somebody had heard I'd done some radio stuff. It was my second year in the NFL. And they brought me in and said, Hey, you want to co-host a show for three hours? Like, absolutely. So the summer before my second year in the NFL, I walked into a three hour radio show, had no idea what I was doing. The host brought us on the air. We went to the first break with two hours and 45 minutes left. And he got up and left. His wife was pregnant. He needed to go home. So I had to host two hours and 45 minutes on a huge AM station in a big market. And uh, I got the news guy was like, just give the phone number out, have people call you. Well, people wanted to talk to the Cardinal. We were pretty good going into that year. I was high draft pick, so I did calls. And then that led to doing some TV. I called arena games while I was still playing on TV. Uh, mm -hmm. They had a team there, the Rattlers. So I did the local broadcast there. So I was side hustling the whole time, man. I was 
I was sort of one foot out. The, I, I almost stayed in five years just to prove I could sort of do it. Like I got here and I could start and I could play. But I was, those first couple of years in Arizona were really hard. I mean, it was just rough because it was a really physical game. We were four and 12. I had two seasons of four and 12 of the five. Not fun. And, and no winning records. My best record was eight and eight. Uh, my third year with the Cardinals. So, you know, and at the line of scrimmage, so I was one foot outdoors. So it was actually the, the, the thing that helped was I'd been, I'd done enough TV and you talked about a competitive market. Not, this was 96. Not everybody was running to the mic to be a broadcaster. And if they were, they were going to the NFL. Hmm. And I wanted to, because I wasn't a big deal in the NFL. I was a starting center for bad teams for four and a half seasons. Right. But I'd won a national championship in college. So I got a media agent my football agent helped me get a really good media agent. He's like, let's pitch you to some college broadcasters. So I had tape. I knew how to do it. And it wasn't a crowded field yet. It was just before I think it became the thing to do. I think I got him, you know, slipped in the door right before. So it was really seamless. So I, my last game was December of 96. I was on the air with CBS doing South Carolina at Georgia for CBS in September of 97. So it took off. And, and I, I, mean, I had three years of broadcasting radio and, and on TV Rattlers games at that point. So I wasn't a TV rookie, but my first job out of the NFL was right to CBS. It was amazing. Really fun. Yeah. Well, it is amazing. And, you know, way to go for you to really be thinking ahead and, and, and about your transition from the NFL and what you're going to do. And then in 2000, uh, you go to ABC, which ultimately I believe was acquired by ESPN. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some merger in there. And so, you know, I, I would always turn on the TV and, you know, you were, I don't know if you're the number one or two or how they slot that, but you were fairly high up there on the, on the totem pole. Yeah, it was nice. So I straddled that. What ha I, so I left CBS to go to ABC and I'll just give you, because you're a football person, you'll get this. And I got that job because that's when Dan Fouts went to Monday Night Football. Mm. So a seat in college football opened up, and it happened to be Dan Fouts' seat. So when I got to ABC, I was already slotted in that. It's it's the 330 East Coast window. That's that's sort of the window, unless you get the big primetime game now, but the 330 window is where they either do the full national or they split it amongst one or two or three, ga or two or three games. And so I got that seat. And then, you know, I worked with great people because once you get to that level, your play-by-play -play guy is great, your producer's great, your director's great. You know, it's like high level. So it's, it's easy to, I think, well, it's easier to excel and do your job if you have full support. I mean, by the end of my career, I was working with camera people and directors for years where we could in five minutes have a conversation and they'd know exactly, you know, what I was looking for or they could share something that they think would support it or whatever. But yeah, that seat's pretty great. We would, you know, some of those Saturday games, if there were three of us, you'd sort of think, okay, you'd hope the other two games would turn into blowouts and your game was competitive because then they'd bring the full audience to you. Right. Yeah. And when they do that, the audience usually grows. So we had games where we were broadcasting like 14, 15 million people by That's the awesome. end of a game. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. Well, look, finding your summit all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And your star could not have been brighter. You're standing on top of the mountain. And, and we're going to get into it for some, some personal reasons. Uh, really, not you necessarily personally, but just, but just, just the way that the game was, was shaping in your stance against CTE mm -hmm. and the concussion uh, protocols and everything like that you literally jumped off the mountain mm. and, you know, like it, it takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of balls. It takes a lot of gumph to, to do that when you're, you're also walking away from a, a salary, you know, and the notoriety and the relationships and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I think all of us were blown away when you didn't make that move. And it speaks a lot to your character on at the end of the day, doing what you felt was the right thing to do. Well, you know, when I left ESPN 2017, I left. I, my last season, I think, was 2016. And, and, and then shared my story about my concern for, uh, you know, the safety of the players. You know, a lot of it, Mark, was I was calling college games. You know, I mentioned I chose college because I had many chances to – I had a chance to actually stay at CBS at one point, and they were going to offer me a really nice NFL package. 
And I turned it down because I just didn't want to cover the NFL. I just enjoyed the college game more. I liked the atmosphere more. I like games being on Saturday, so I'm home on Sunday. <laughs> you know, I sort of like that life. But the, the part for me when I was starting to make more money and get a higher profile, this is before name, image, and likeness was given back to the athletes just this past July. You know, those guys, you were there. I was there when Don James became the first seven-figure head coach. He was the first person to make a million bucks. In, in, uh, you, never, you know, so I was there when that stuff was happening. And so my biggest issue was I had some issues with the safety of the game, but what we were asking of these young men and sometimes still just teen boys, cause they get there 17, 18, 19, they're still teenagers was I thought too much that they weren't getting anything returned. They were employees. It was time to start treating them as that. And, you know, I had to make a choice of, do I share that story or not share that story? Cause I could have just rode off into the sunset and not shared it. If I had left an NFL gig for that concern, I wouldn't have shared it because uh, who cares? They're, you know, it's professional and, and they're still young men when they get there, but th it's a different, you know, structure than college sports. But the reason I shared it is because it was amateurs. The reason I was leaving that uh, job was because it was amateurs. And so I felt like I sort of needed to, like you said, you have a platform. I wanted one last sort of thing is like, this is not fair to these kids. And I'm so, I'm thrilled that the dam has broken on this name, image, and likeness, and that these kids can start profiting off of what they own. It's one of our most prime rights as an American citizen is your identity. And now that these kids can profit. So I'm glad I spoke up. I learned some things, some things that I didn't expect came out of that. Not all good. <laughs> you know, you never know the sort of consequences, but I, I'm glad I did because of the amateurism. You know, you and I played college sports. It's time for these kids to get a piece of the pie. So did you have a plan? Like, you know, you're going through this. It was obviously it was heavy on your mind and heavy on your heart, heavy on your soul. But did you have like, okay, so when you just get down to the, you, you take the emotional side out of it and you, you yeah. insert the business side into it and you go, yeah. okay, I'm making X. Now, how are we going to replace that pipeline? I mean, what, what was going through your mind there? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I the other thing I've been doing is was sort of a side hustle and became the main hustle is I'm a filmmaker and producer and and I have some entrepreneurial uh, interests. So that's been a part of the big transition for me is like you said, getting off that salary and becoming an independent businessman. Yeah. And you know, it's 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 more of a grind, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, it's more of a profit and loss rests on my desk, but I'm growing there. Uh, it's becoming easier to do that. So that transition's been, it was a little slow to start on purpose. When I left, I just needed a little, I got to, you know, I got to just get off the treadmill. I've been traveling for like 22 weeks a year for a long time, you know, and, and really grinding at that job. So I needed to uh, step off of it. But yeah, that's been the piece is becoming now producer, more filmmaking, I've got, just gotten into the merchandise business. We got a, a launch coming of a merchandise line here pretty soon. Hmm. Um, so just, you know, stepping off of that. And, and a lot of that very much connected to sports. Almost everything I work on is some type of football connection, some sports story. You know, that's what I know, what I love. But I have a, a film that just came out now about a World War II veteran, a documentary. So I still, you know, have, have um, interests away from sports. Uh, but a lot of it is, is focused around, you know, what I've done and known my whole life. Yeah. So I'll go back to what we talked about earlier about Don James from that gap we were talking about from 1987 to 1990, roughly when like he either had to like up his game or in evolve and shape, yeah. or he was going to be out of the game that he so much loved and he was so good at. Right. And, and you had to do essentially the same thing. Now I know you just said that you were starting to like dip your toe into the whole movie doc business but there's no guarantees behind that and that's it's a very competitive business once again kind of like you know the nfl was and mm -hmm. playing major college football at the university of washington and being on championship teams and and being in the broadcast business but you were able to actually get up there so this goes back i don't i don't have this in front of me the the, the actual night i know you will know this night but um, I'm watching the Oscars and all of a mm -hmm. sudden they, they, uh, they throw these names down and I'm watching you standing up on stage, collecting an Oscar for the undefeated. And yeah. I was just like, uh, what? And I text yeah. her like, wow, man, this is so cool. It's, <laughs> you know, congrats. 
And yet again, you know, you, it's kind of like some of the things that I think that, you know, you mentioned early on is very kind of you, but, you know, I've, I've immersed myself in many of these different things, you know, the film, the climbing, philanthropy, there's a book coming, my work with Sports Illustrated, uh, but you got to put yourself in those positions, right? You got to step into the fear if that's what that was for you. Like you had no idea, but if you don't go out there and you swing the bat, man, you're never going to get the opportunity to stand on stage and hold the golden Oscar. I mean, it was just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That was a cool moment. I think I got 1200 texts in three hours. My phone eventually died because I had it on vibrate. And, and I think for me staying grounded and, and, you know, I didn't make that movie for the money. I haven't made a lot of money off of it, frankly. Right. And I think that's one of the things I've been able to do is stay true to what I want to work on and, and be able to choose that. And, and I think that helps me because I've always sort of done it that way. I think that helps me want to take big swings and they, maybe they don't work out, you know, and producing is a lot like that. I mean, I have a list of 35 projects that, you know, never got made for this reason or the, or that, or whatever. You, you just got to keep churning them out basically. But you know, that night in particular, it was the perfect combination of my worlds because it was an independent documentary film that I made with six guys about football. <laughs> so it was really, it was my whole sort of realm. And I sort of work with six or seven people now on average uh, across a couple projects and I keep it you know, pretty small. There's no reason for me to become some big production entity. But that night was, uh, and that was a project I didn't want to work on a partner of mine, Seth Gordon, who's uh, also from Seattle, his parents, um, professors there at the University of Washington, but he, he called me and he said, Hey, I met these young filmmakers. They need some savvy producers to help make this film. You know, they have an idea, they have access. It's about football. And I was like, I had no interest because I was already calling games on ESPN. I'm like, I get enough football on the fall. If I'm going to help make an independent film, I want it to be about a rock band or the King of Kong, which is about Donkey Kong. You know, I want it to be a little quirky, mm -hmm. but I met the, I met the guys, uh, Dan Lindsay and TJ Martin, who, who directed the film and, and Rich Middlemus, who's the producer who found the story and, and went, moved to Memphis with them ultimately to film. I, I met them. They're smart guys. They'd already made a film so I could see their work. It was real good work. And so we said, well, go film some stuff and come back and let's see. And they went there, they got access, they filmed for like two weeks, they came back and they cut together, you know, eight or 10 minutes about like six characters, including the coach, Bill Courtney, who, who becomes one of the key figures. And I just was in tears, man. I was like, oh my God, this is so much more than just football. And, and I think that was part of my job working with those guys, especially through the edit is, how do we give as little football as possible for it to matter and connect to all the stories off the field, mm. you know, because you can't just be on the field and they immerse themselves. They, we had 4,000 hours of embedded documentary footage to make that hour and 50 minute film, 4,000 hours. They, they filmed all the time for five months, all the time. It's amazing. That is amazing. And the thing I love about what you said is that when you got the 1200 text, you're able to be in a state of mind that you could really have that sink in and be present with those people like me, you know, yeah. I was just, you know, you didn't need to text me back, but you did. And it was just, it was nothing big, but just, you know, appreciate you or something. And the same thing happened to me when I summited Mount Everest um, yeah. and, you know, kind of leading up to that, there was a, you know, trying to become the first NFL player to do it. And I, there was a lot of notoriety that's come, come my way. I'm very grateful for that um, in the movie and, you know, other things, but, the kind of the common point is I was able to be really present because I already had my 15 minutes of fame way back in the day. And, I, yeah. and I, as a mature, immature young punk, you know, yeah, yeah. I did whatever I did back then, but I was really able to just like sink it in because I, I just know that those moments are just moments in time. And, and just like my ever saying, the attention that all goes off the cliff. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the question <laughs> yeah. is, you know, what's really going to yeah, what's after you? that? Yeah, yeah. What's after that? And that's kind of yeah. really where my head's at. And I can tell that, you know, you, you won that, but now you're on to these other movie projects on how you can affect emotion and change with other people. And also for me, it was accepting for me, it helped me feel validated within the Hollywood world. Cause I'd mm -hmm. always been an outsider. I always been a jock, no, you know, a lot of meetings I have in Hollywood, they have no, I, they would, I would have been on air that Saturday calling a game in front of millions of people on ABC 
and have a meeting at, on Thursday at a network to pitch a show. And that person would have no idea that I was on the air that Saturday because it really is, uh, other than a few areas like Sports Illustrated with their studio deal, it, there are places that do sports, but most, most of Hollywood doesn't really care. So that was a way for me. And, you know, through a sports football movie where for me, it just helped with the confidence of, hey, I belong here. It does help to sort of have a little swagger, have a little confidence in what you're doing. I think in anything you do, football, Hollywood, whatever, walk in the room, have a presence about you, you belong. Know that, and I, you know, the Oscar, I didn't need the Oscar for that, but it, you know, it was a little like, okay, man, you got this. You, you belong here. You can play this game. Oh, for sure. I mean, look, you do belong, and there's nothing better on your resume when, you know, if you're a mountain climber and you're saying Mount Everest or the NFL or Sports Illustrated or you want to Oscar, I mean, you know, that also means that there's a lot of hard work and dedication, and that's all the stuff that people don't see behind the scenes yeah. of what it takes to make a champion, and that's a champion in a different way, but you were a champion, and, you know, you, you always – for sure, always belong in the room talking to any one of those guys. I got to ask you just like a, this is like the the People Magazine mark coming out in me right now of, of you know, you've, you're you you're in that world. I'm not, who, who, give me an example of the biggest star you've been able to, and I know you're more on the documentary side, but have you been able to, you know, with, with your Oscar, in any way you're hanging out with Brad Pitt or I don't know, I'm just making this up. I, I, so it, it, it did change that level because if you're a doc maker, you're not really in that world. Yeah. But two things happened where we won the Oscar. And then the guy who's my, uh, at the time was more a regular part, but we still partner on stuff. I mentioned his name, Seth Gordon. Mm-hmm. Seth is now a, a really a list director and, and TV executive producer. And so he's, so I go on sets a lot or we've done things that became something he made and I'll go. Uh, I actually worked on a show with Christian Slater for a while uh, called breaking in um that was on fox and you know so i've been i've been in production or around stuff like that but not as much as nonfiction. but the coolest thing was the weekend of the oscars you uh each of and it's sort of changed now obviously COVID, whatever but each of the major hollywood agencies one of their partners or owners would host a, a weekend party oscars yeah. on sunday so yeah. on saturday from five to midnight is always those parties. Well, we all got invited to Ari Emanuel's house of Endeavor WME, who had a character, Ari Gold, in that movie Entourage. Like, this is literally that guy. So we went to his home in Westwood, and because they have the parties regularly, his backyard, you didn't know you were in a backyard. The whole yard had a massive tent structure across the entire thing. Part of it was over the pool. Part of it was over the basketball courts. You're in this, I don't know, 25,000 square foot tent with a food area and bathrooms over there. And they just built it and it's custom built for this guy's yard. And in that room, everybody's guard was down. Nobody was big time in anybody. And a couple of things happened. Uh, One was I was with Seth Gordon and I was standing there. And five heads of major studios in Hollywood were all standing there having a drink and talking. And Seth, my partner, was like, hey, you want to go meet five studio heads? Of course. And we turn around and he was like, hey, guys, this because Seth had worked with a couple of them already. He's like, hey, this, this is Eddie. He produced King Kong. We're like, hey, whatever. I sat there and shot the bull for 25 minutes with five studio execs and ended up talking to one of their wives for a long time about kids. So yeah. <laughs> that was, forget all the stars. Um that was pretty cool. And yeah, it was just because it was just low key. We just, we, and business didn't come up, which is very unusual for Hollywood. It was, Hey, Oh, you guys are nominated for that. Congrats. You know, it was more fun and jovial. It was amazing. But every time we turned around, there was an A-lister standing there talking to somebody and you can just say, hi, Hey, what's up? Yeah. I'll see you. Pretty cool. It was pretty great. Well, again, you got to put yourself in those positions and, and you certainly did. So I, I guess the, the 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 last question of the hour here is, what is next for you? What is next for Ed? What's on the the horizon? I imagine it's another doc or another movie that you're working on right now. I, so I, I have a bunch of projects. One uh, called Jerry's Last Mission that's out now. Uh, it's available. Well, December fourth, it'll be available wide on Apple iTunes um, as a, a transactional video on demand. 
and I love the movie. So Jerry's Last Mission is about a World War II fighter pilot. He flew the last mission over Japan, mm. um, the last combat mission, came home, had four sons, was really beat up with PTSD and not doing very well. He found something, and I don't want to give away what he did, but he really yeah. started to change his life around quite a bit. And then his youngest son moved back to Japan and married the daughter of a kamikaze pilot. Mm. And so we have this really great, unique story that's really uplifting called Jerry's Last Mission. So please go watch it. It's available. You know, when this goes out, I'll, I can't it's, wait. Yeah, it's really great. Then I have a couple of other movies. I have a, uh, helped produce a film called Chess Boxing. Uh, it's about chess boxing called by rook or left hook, which is a, a professionalized sport of boxing and uh, speed chess mixed mm. together. Wow. Um, it's really sort of quirky and weird. But then, you know, you that's sort of my day to day grind. But you mentioned next big challenge. I'm in the process. And I mentioned to you on text of maybe taking a position at a it's sort of a startup, but it's it's partnered with a major a uh, major media company. So uh, I can't talk about it, but I've been uh, consulting on it for about seven months and now talking about taking an inside job, which would go back to, you know, what you were talking about with the SPN. Mm -hmm. I'd go back into that sort of big company salary world, which wouldn't be the worst thing, but also it's something yeah. that would be a really great challenge and a whole big step for me. It'd be an executive. I've never been an executive in a company and I would, uh, th this is the role I would be taking. And that's pretty scary and, you know, pretty, uh, It'd be all brand new for me, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm ready for it. Well, you're, uh, you've always met the challenge at hand, and I have no doubt that you would do the same thing with this next challenge that's in front of you. So, all right, buddy, listen, where can people find you? Oh, well, uh, so I have a podcast. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. Uh, Let's Huddle with Ed Cunningham, wherever you podcast, and then on Twitter, at Let's Huddle with. And then if you're on LinkedIn, I, I – prefer LinkedIn. If you want to reach out personally, I think that's a better way for people to connect, but I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm trying to be pretty responsive, uh, there, but Twitter at let's huddle with, and the podcast is let's huddle with Ed Cunningham. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right, buddy. Listen, it's great to get caught up with you after all these years, a fellow Husky. He is the one, the only Ed Cunningham. Thank you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.